before moving, moving to the University of Oxford for a doctorate in astrophysics. She was a researcher in the USA and Canada before moving to Japan to take up a faculty position at Hokkaido University in Sapporo. She moved to JAXA in 2016. With no other further comments, please welcome our guest speaker tonight. This one sounds better. We can compete with microphones. Mine wins. And it turns out that I actually had no aptitude whatsoever for experiments. 
So in the end, I graduated in theoretical physics, where I switched up the experiments for more mathematical courses. And I guess if I'm going to think of some take-home messages from this part of my life, I would say for a start, I would have actually made a dreadful bet. I mean, really, I had no aptitude for that whatsoever. But having a plan for your future is great. You know, it's fun to think about all the things you could possibly do and pick which one you are most excited by. But it's always worth being open to new ideas, especially if they come from people who know you quite well. And you're always welcome to dismiss these if you think you're right, because it's your future. But it is worth considering. And then you can always make a new plan afterwards. So after the University of Durham, I went to do my graduate studies at the University of Oxford down in the south of England. And I got a PhD in astrophysics. Now, a PhD is a research training qualification. So if you want to be a scientific researcher, then the PhD is the first step on that path. And if you complete this and you graduate, then you get the title doctor. And I wrote my PhD thesis on computer models of galaxies. And you might say, well, that's a bit different from being a vet in the country. Why did you get interested in computer modeling? And the answer is that when you do computer modeling, physics becomes like a giant toy box, where each of your toys is a different physical process. So for example, one of your toys might be gas flow, another might be a process like gravity. Uh, there's processes like heat or magnetic fields or mysterious dark matter or star formation. And they're all elements in your toy box. And when you do computer simulations, you can choose to turn bits of these off and find out which are the most important. So for example, you can build a whole new universe which only has gravity, gas, and heat, and doesn't allow stars to fall. And you can see what it would be like. Or you might choose your universe to have gas, winds from young stars, and magnetic fields, but no gravity. What would that look like? And by switching these processes on and off, you can tell what they do. Whereas normally, when you observe, you can't turn magnetic fields off in the real universe, and you can't turn star formation off. So you have everything mixed together, and it's quite hard to tell what role each process is playing. So I wanted to show you an example from my thesis where I tried this out to prove it works. And to do that, we need to take a very quick crash course in how we form a star. So, we are all living in our galaxy, which is the Milky Way. And the universe is full of galaxies. We don't know exactly what ours looks like, because we're inside it. But we think it looks something like these other galaxies. We think it's a disk, and it has spiral arms. Now, if you zoom in on one of these spiral arms, what you see are cold clouds of gas and dust. And if you zoom in to the densest part of those clouds, you see that gravity is compressing the gas to very, very high densities. And here is where you start to form stars. So you can see that in this simulation. This isn't one of mine, it's from one of my colleagues. Oh, here we go. Um, so you can zoom into the simulation of this cloud, and here blue represents dense gas. And as you get to the densest areas of the clouds, you'll start to see little white dots forming. And these are the newly formed stars, and they're forming in the very densest regions of this cold cloud. So you can see a few are starting there, and more and more are going to start forming. So, in the simulation I did, I put in some stars, and I put in these clouds of gas and dust where I thought some stars might form. And what I expected was the stars would heat up the surrounding gas and dust. However, after that, there was a bit of a mystery. You see, as the dust becomes warm, it also starts to radiate heat, a little bit like if you put a frying pan on a stove. 
the stone is hot, but after time, the frying pan also becomes hot and starts to leak it. So my question is, as the dust becomes warm and heats the gas further, is this important? Can we ignore this secondary effect of heat? Or is it going to change something about the galaxy? So, we did some simulations. So I modeled the whole galaxy disk, but I'm going to show you just a quarter of it, so you can see a close-in of what's going on. And this is what that quarter looks like if we ignore dust heating. Now, excuse the technicolors. The point is that yellow and red are dense gas. This is where we expect the star formation to happen. And if we compare that to another otherwise identical simulation, but one where I have included dust heating, we can see the galaxy actually looks quite different. In the place where we have no dust heating, there is more of this yellow and red material. So the gas is generally denser. Whereas when I added dust heating, there's less really dense gas. So what we think is happening here is when there's no dust, we have these clouds of gas, and gravity is going to start squishing them. And so they get steadily denser, and then lots of stars form. However, when we include the dust heating, we have a cloud of gas and dust. But the heating sort of pushes this out, and it counters the compression. So over time, less dense areas form because the gas is much hotter. This is a bit like a hot air balloon. If you don't have a hot air, the thing collapses in itself. But if you put hot air into that, it expands. And a similar way here, this dust heating was stopping these clouds collapsing and becoming very dense. So what we found was that dust heating actually reduces stars in the galaxy. So it's quite an important effect. So, the bottom line is, why do we do computer models? Really because it's super fun to treat the universe as a toy box, and you can just play around with physics to your heart's content. So, after my PhD, I went and did a series of postdoctoral fellowships. And these are positions for new researchers. It's what, that is the title, postdoctoral, literally after your doctorate. And I did these at Columbia University in New York. I spent a year there. I spent three years at the University of Florida. And I spent two years at McMaster University in Canada. And these positions are designed to be quite short. They're typically only between one and two years. And they're normally 100% research. So you don't typically teach during this time. And the point is to build experience and collaborations with different groups to train you as a researcher. And because they're short term, and because you're counted as a trainee, it's actually a great opportunity to travel and live abroad if you want to. Because it's moderately easy to get a visa during this time, because you're considered a short term worker. So, there is one thing about my experiences as a postdoctoral researcher that I would like to talk about, because I suspect it's something that everyone in this room has experienced to some degree or another. And this occurred when I was having lunch with my friend Mikhail. And Mikhail was a graduate student at McMaster University when I was a postdoc. And he was actually an incredibly good researcher. He always seemed very confident, and he knew a lot. So thank you, I might have been slightly jealous, because Mikhail always seemed to know what he was doing and he seemed to express it very clearly and very confidently. And even though I was more senior, I often felt I hadn't really got myself together as much as he had. But one day at lunch, he says to me, Elizabeth, have you ever thought about leaving astrophysics and doing a different career? And my third thought was, yes, maybe, because I wasn't sure I was good enough to become a professor in astrophysics. And then I thought, if you're asking me this question, you must feel the same way. And I also realized that he was asking because he saw me the same way that I saw him. He saw me as very confident and very clear about what I wanted to do. And this was very 
very surprising. But it is something that is steadily being talked about more in academia. And indeed, I've seen one of the posters is on anxiety. And this is very similar to that. This is something called imposter syndrome. And to summarize, it's you feel you're flawed because you feel everyone around you is actually better than you are. And the reason this happens is that this is what you think the situation is. You have your small pool of knowledge. And you look around you and everyone seems to know more than that. So you believe all of your classmates, all of your colleagues have a lot more knowledge than you. The truth is like this. You all have roughly the same amount of knowledge, but it's all slightly different. So it seems that around you everyone knows more, but actually they just know slightly different things. But this can often make you feel very inferior. And if you don't talk about it, you can often feel that you're the only one experiencing this. Bigger or not, everyone experiences this. So what I wanted to say was, if you ever think at any point during your career that you're not good enough, I can assure you with 100% certainty that absolutely everybody feels this way. And that you are good enough. And what you're experiencing is imposter syndrome. And I'm willing to bet that the person next to you is experiencing it too. So, despite my complete disbelief in myself, my next step was to become an assistant professor at the Kaido University in Sapporo. And an assistant professor is a junior faculty job. This is the first rung of the faculty ladder. And it's an almost permanent position. Normally, you have somewhere between five and ten years to make the next run up, which is assistant. And as an assistant professor, I had a variety of duties. I was still primarily a researcher. I also trained young trainer Jedi's, by which I mean graduate students. So I had my own group. And I was also teaching undergraduate and graduate classes. Now, after five years in Hokkaido, I moved down to JAXA, where I became an associate professor. An associate professor is a more senior position, and it is actually permanent. And in the US, it is often referred to as tenure, and sometimes also in Japan. Now, my duties at JAXA are in some ways very similar. I still do a lot of research, I still supervise students. I'm not actually teaching classes at the moment, and that's because JAXA is not a university. So we have some classes for graduate students, but not as many as a typical university. So I might teach in the future, but as of this point, I'm not currently doing that. However, I am doing a lot of science communication. And you might say, how did this suddenly appear when you were talking about research and suddenly come back to you doing science communication? Well, to understand that, we have to take a sneaky look at what I was doing outside work. So, I was doing all my research at my universities, but beyond that, I was doing a lot of writing. Really, because I really enjoyed it. So when I was little, I wrote a lot of fiction. Everybody died, all the time. It was really very messy. As I got a bit older, I started a personal blog, where since it was about me, less people typically died. And this was more like a hundred old moment in which life confused me very much on a good day. And then I started entering science writing contests, because they were available to students and they were good fun. And then as I got still more senior, I started to use this to write science stories for my university. So I would visit you know, my lab and other labs, and I would summarize what they were doing and put it as an article in their magazine or on the web. And then I started doing more and more of this for actually new sites, like Scientific American, Astronomy Magazine, places like that. So as this happened, my research world and my writing world started to overlap. And I thought, really I should make this a little bit more official, and put all my writing equipment together. And so I created a website, in which previously I'd been keeping a blog sort of anonymously, but now I put everything together on one website. And I had my personal blog, I had the science writing I was doing for the university and the different media outlets. And I just put it all together in one place. And the idea I had was, well, this is a portfolio. So if I approach a magazine I haven't written for before, I can say to them, 
you know, I could, I'd like to write this piece, and here is where you can see my experience. And you know, I had a, I had a contact form on this page, and I thought I'd have a bit of a laugh. So I read the following. I put, ah, well, messages, screams of adoration, offers to turn my blog into the sensation that makes me the second woman novelist on the Forbes billionaire list. Please, just fill this box in right here. And you know, it was just a joke. I wasn't thinking much of it. Incidentally, the first female novelist on the Forbes billionaire list, that is J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books. I put this together, I didn't think much of it really. And then some months later, I received an email. The email I received was from Bloomsbury Publishing House, the same publishing house that published the Harry Potter books. And the title was Forbes Billionaire List Possibilities. And Bloomsbury said to me, We really like your website, we like your writing. Would you like to write us a book? which was pretty astounding. And three years later, this was the result. This is my popular science book on planet formation and exoplanets. Now, there's no denying whatsoever, I got extremely lucky here. Normally, if you want to write a book, you approach an agent, you explain your idea, you probably give them a writing sample, and then go and approach publishers and see who's interested. I short that a lot by the publisher coming to me. So then I offered an official writing sample and an official book plan and they accepted it. And I didn't expect this to happen. I didn't know that Bloomsbury were developing a new science writing series. I didn't know they were looking for new authors. But I wouldn't have got lucky if I hadn't put this website together and made it possible for me to be found. So it showed people what I love doing, and I put as many examples of me doing that as possible in one place to make myself findable. So you can't control everything. Sometimes you do get lucky. But if I had one piece of advice to offer, I would say, get lucky. Put what you want to do out there and make it findable. Tell people what you love doing, and you might find some surprising opportunities. Now, why write? Why do I like this so much? Now, of course, I, I mentioned I've been doing this for a long time, right back to my days of grisly murder stories when I was in my teens. However, I feel that why I science write was actually best put in a lecture I attended while I was at Cairo University. And the person who gave this lecture was Jean Marc Ferrier, who is the senior advisor of the World Federation of Science Writers and Science Journalists. And he was giving a talk to a whole mixed audience. There was undergraduates, graduates, and faculty, all his audience. And he stood there and he said to us, I've only made one assumption about everyone in the audience. He said, I've assumed that everyone here wants to change the world. And I sat there and I thought, hell yeah, that is me. Now, if you're not for any story, is really inspirational. The example he gives about how science journalism can make a difference. He said that while he was working as a journalist, he heard about some research being done. And the research was being done by Canadian researchers, actually just in a very small village in Tanzania. And what they found is that they could get a huge decrease in, in death of infants, so small children under a few years old, they could decrease it by 28%, so almost one third, just by redistributing the money that was currently there. So currently there was money, obviously, for health, but it was being spread very thinly, and as a result, it wasn't very effective. And what this group found was that you could look at what the most common causes of death were, focus your attention on those areas, and really make a difference there. But this was you know, a scientific paper, it was based on a very small village, and it might have gone unnoticed. But Jean-Marc Ferret approached the person who was the editor of The Economist, a magazine that has a very, very large reader base. And he said, the story is important. We need it to get some publicity. 
And in August 2002, he published an article called the 80 Cents Mail, which is a small amount of money needed to rearrange these funds and actually affect how many infants were dying. And this reached a lot more people than the science paper ever would have known. And the result was that Tanzania rolled out these changes nationwide rather than just one village. And he said they were on track a two-third drop in child mortality across the whole country. And this was obviously an incredibly inspiring story. I don't have a story quite as good as this, I have to admit. But I have found that science writing has helped me influence causes I really care about. And to understand one of these, we need to start talking about exoplanets. So our sun is one of the 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And when we talk about exoplanets or extrasolar planets, extra here means outside, and solar means the sun. So an extrasolar planet is a planet that is beyond the sun. It's always a star that is not our sun. And the story I want to tell starts with a star called GJ832 or Gliese832. And this star was known to be orbited by one planet that was a giant gas planet. And it was discovered in 2008, and it got the name GJ832b as the first planet around that star. However, in 2014, so this planet was roughly the size of Jupiter, so a great big gas this world. But in 2014, another planet was discovered. This was GJ832c. And its work mass was much smaller. It had a minimum mass of roughly five times the mass of the Earth. So it was almost certainly a rocky world, as opposed to a giant gaseous one. And this was the research paper that was published on this discovery. And right at the front we have the abstract, which always summarises the main points. And this abstract said the following. Given the large mass of the planet, so five times to the Earth at least, it would likely possess a massive atmosphere. That is, its gravity would probably be stronger than the Earth, and it will pull down more gases. And this may well render the planet inhospitable. So it's likely that GJ832c wasn't so much a very large Earth, but a super Venus. Let's take a quick look at Venus compared to the Earth. So Venus is a planet that's roughly the same size and mass as our own. But unlike ours, it has a thicker atmosphere, made of carbon dioxide primarily. And this means that while the global average surface temperature of the Earth is about 15 Celsius, the average surface temperature of Venus, 460 Celsius. And the longest a spacecraft has ever survived on the Venetian surface is less than two hours. So, if we have a planet that is being described as a habitable super Venus, do we think that is likely? I'm thinking no, 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 no. Super Venus does not spell habitability at all. And yet, after this paper came out, the press went completely wild. We had stories like new found alien planet, these a 3 c may be able to support that. We had nearby exoplanet is the best candidate for supporting life. We had Gliese 832c, potentially habitable super-Earth, discovered 16 light years away. Or potentially habitable super-Earth is just 16 light years away. So there were, you know, supporting life, habitable, super-Earth. I mean, we should just go, guys. Come on, where's your suitcase? So how did this happen? I mean, it was right there in the abstract. I hadn't got very far down the paper. It was describing it as a super Venus, but suddenly everyone was talking about how we were going to find life there. So I had a look at these articles a bit more closely, and I saw they all mentioned something called the ESI. It's not a really high ESI value, definitely habitable. And I thought, what the hell is the ESI? So I did a bit of digging. The ESI stands for the Earth Similarity Index. And what if there is one equation coming up? 
It's this one. And it looks big and it looks complicated, and therefore you think, oh, yeah, I'm just being very, very scientific. Actually, let's break it down a bit. And what this equation says is you take your exoplanet property, for example, mass or radius, and you subtract from that the same property of the Earth. So you've got the difference. And you raise that to some sort of power, depending on how important you think it is. And you can do this for several different properties and multiply them together. And that gives you the ESI. So the ESI uses four different properties. It uses density of the planet. Is the planet gaseous or is it very dense? Or is it like super dense and made of iron? It uses the planet radius. And it uses something called the escape velocity, which is how fast you need to move to escape the planet's gravity. So it's a measure of how strong that gravity is. And it uses the planet's temperature. I have a lot of problems with this. We're going to talk about two of them. Problem number one. None of these properties actually tell you what it's like on the surface of the planet. You've got a radius, but it's not telling you about mountains or valleys or what the rock type is or whether there's a stream or a river. So it's very hard to use these properties to say that something's really going to be Earth-like when they don't directly relate to what it's really like to stand there. Also, what makes the Earth Earth a habitable environment depends on many, many factors that are just not included in this form. For example, we have volcanoes. Now, you might think that doesn't help habitability. It actually turns out very important for our planet developing atmosphere. We're protected by a magnetic field. The sun, apart from radiation, also has a stream of high energy particles coming from it, along with things like flares. Our magnetic field protects our planet. It channels those particles down to the poles, and we get the northern sun lights. Without that, that radiation could hit the surface and possibly sterilize us. Our crust, our surface of the planet, is broken up into plates, giving us something called plate tectonics. This allows material to be cycled within the planet from the surface down to the mantle. It also helps with our cooling, which helps support our magnetic field. Our rock type is super important also for controlling our temperature and for the chemistry that goes on on the planet. And of course, we actually have water. There's no guarantee that the planet is similar size and density of us or have any at all. And these are just some of the factors I thought of. None of these are included in this ESI calculation. So really, it's a little bit like this Facebook game. Which friend do you look like the most? This was a game run by Facebook. And the idea was they took your profile picture, they compared it with that of your friends, and it told you, who do you look like the most? All right, let's play. This is my Facebook profile picture. Which of my friends do I look like the most, according to this game? Draw the model. The answer was, the friend that you, the friend I look most like, is the one whose profile picture was a bag of crisps. <laughs> <laughs> so, apparently, I am the twin of a bag of crisps. So where did this happen? Well, either there's not enough comparison points between my photo and my friend's photos, or they're using the wrong models. And the same principle is applied here. We're using four properties, and they're not any of them that actually tell you what it's like on the surface. So the chances are the number isn't going to mean a lot. My second problem with this whole calculation is that when we see exoplanets, we typically only actually see two things. We see either the radius of the planet or we see its minimum mass. And we also see how much radiation it receives from this star. Now this second one gives you something that we call the equilibrium temperature. It is the temperature of the planet not including the atmosphere, because we don't know what that atmosphere is like. Now if we do this for the Earth, our equilibrium temperature is actually minus 18 Celsius. If that was our true temperature, our oceans would freeze, and we wouldn't have any life. As we mentioned, our true surface temperature is 15 Celsius. 
For Venus, the equilibrium temperature is 27 Celsius. Really very pleasant, nice summer day. Not too hot, not too cold. Well, again, because of Venus's thick carbon dioxide atmosphere, the true surface temperature is about 360. Quite different. So this doesn't include the effect of atmosphere, which is huge and very hard to estimate. So what happens when you do these calculations is you take these just two measurements and you kind of guesstimate what the other properties are. And then as a result, you get this number. So in the case of GJ832C, we have a minimum mass five times the Earth. And we have the amount of radiation that planet is receiving. And from that, some guesses were made, those four properties were calculated, and the result was an ESI of 0.81, which is out of 1, so 81% like the Earth. Which is why the whole press went, whoa, must be a close match. But actually why the number really doesn't mean anything. So just to completely see all that, if we consider Venus as an exoplanet, and ask what would its ESI be, the number we get is 0.9. We would say it was 19% the same as the Earth. But it melts lead on the surface. That is, it's not a good match to us. So what did I do? Well, with some of my colleagues, I wrote an article for The Conversation. And this is a website that academics typically write for. But uh, it's, read, it's written for the public. It's written for anyone who's interested. And they said, no, that new exoplanet is not the best candidate to support life. And I made the same points I've made to you all today. I said, look, we're only really observing two properties. And they don't really relate to the surface conditions. And there's lots of things we're not including. And Venus and the Earth have approximately the same size, but wildly different surfaces. And so when you find an Earth-sized planet, it doesn't actually mean it will be at all Earth-like. And this article was picked up by several different media outlets, and it started circulating around, and other sites started reproducing it. Now, I admit, this maybe didn't completely change the world, but it did make a difference. The article is still being read even today, and I published this some years ago, but it's now out there, the information is there. And if you have questions about exoplanets, you might find one of these articles telling you what we really know. And as a result, the ESI is seen much less nowadays when it's been talked about exoplanets. And I think that's a real success. And I care a lot about this because I'm really excited about where we are with finding exoplanets. And in the coming years, all within your lifetime, we're going to start really finding out about these planets. We're going to start finding out about their atmospheres. And that might even tell us if some of these are habitable. If we pretend we already know, then everyone misses out on that journey. And I don't know why you don't want to do that to people. So, when I applied for my job at JAXA, they were advertising for an associate professor. And I wrote them a letter that went something like, Dear JAXA, I would like to apply for the position of associate professor. Now, my thread of research is a little different from most of the missions we've done at JAXA. But I'm an experienced science communicator, and I would really like this to be part of my job and share information about Jack's missions with the world. And this was different from what they advertised, but they took it seriously, they interviewed me, and then they offered me the position. So Jack's didn't advertise for a science communicator initially. But I did notice that their initial outreach was not as strong as the outreach they were doing in Japanese. And so I suggested this combined position where I was still a researcher, but I spent some of my time working with the missions and translating into English and making sure that information reached a worldwide audience. And so what I want to say is if you think something's a good idea, ask. People will take you seriously. And maybe if they hadn't wanted that, they just would have said no. Nothing bad would have happened. They just would have been thanks for what they're looking for. As it is, they consider the suggestion seriously, and I got a job I really wanted. So it's always worth asking. So I feel I would be amiss at this stage if I then didn't tell you something about Jackson missions. These are our missions 
that are in the solar system. So not actually including our astrophysics and astronomy ones, looking at places beyond the solar system, telescopes. And in red are our current missions, and the other missions are our planning ones. And these actually all have a theme. The theme is to understand how a planet can become habitable. And one of the most exciting missions currently is Hayabusa 2. So this is a mission that's currently ongoing, and we're currently at Asteroid Reunion. So to understand why this being an asteroid is exciting, we need to know a little bit about planet formation. So young stars are surrounded by dust and gas. And in these disks, microscopic grains collide and stick. And they form steadily bigger and bigger objects going up centimeter and meter size. And eventually, gravity gets enthusiastic and pulls it into a ball. And we start seeing something that resembles a planet. Now, there's one small complication that's worth mentioning. I'm sure we're standing everyone. If you are trying to build a planet near a huge burning ball of gas that is your new star, you are going to be hot. Whereas if you're forming further away, it's going to be colder. And what that means is there's a point in the disk where water freezes into ice. And we call this the ice line the snow line, or sometimes the frost line. And if you form inside the ice line, then the building material, the grains you're forming from, are predominantly dry, they're silicates. If you form outside the ice line, then ice joins in this process, and you form with a mixture of ices and silicates. So that means the planets that form outside the ice line tend to contain plenty of water. They're wet planets. Whereas the planets that form within the ice line are dry. So here's a question. The Earth formed, we think, within our ice line. But we're covered with oceans. So where did our water come from? Well, one theory is that when Jupiter and Saturn and the other large giants formed, they were surrounded by these icy rocks. And some of these went into the planet. But some were accelerated by the planet's very strong gravitational pull. And they slammed inwards towards the inner solar system. And they gave our planet water as they landed. So, can we test this? Well, fortunately, we just might be able to. So in between Mars and Jupiter is a band of rocky, rocky leftovers known as the asteroid belt. And these are really the spare parts of planet formation. They're things like the nuts and bolts you inevitably get left over when you try and build an IKEA piece of furniture. And there's a certain type of asteroid called a C-type or carbonaceous type. And these are thought to contain organic molecules like this found on Earth. And also have not experienced much change since the very start of the solar system 4.56 billion years ago. And this means that these rocks are really time capsules for the early days of the solar system. They're siblings to the rocks that would have hit the young Earth and might have delivered to our oceans. So, if we go to one of these rocks and we have a look at it and we compare the minerals and organics with those on Earth, and it's a match, that would mean that we might have in our hands a life starter kit for the planet. It would explain how we all got there, and it would also help us understand how habitable planets form and where we might find another one. So, this is the purpose of the Hydrogen 2 mission, which was launched in 2014. And it arrived at the asteroid last summer, at the end of June 2018. It's been doing some remote observations from orbit, and it's dropped several landers on there, including a lander designed by the French and German Space Agency, and two small rovers known as the Minerva 2 ones, that practice movement in a low gravity environment and popped around the asteroid. And then just a few weeks ago, Hyacinth 2 performed the first touchdown operation to collect a sample from the asteroid's surface. So the asteroid that Hyabus 2 visited in Asteroid Ryubu is what we call a near-Earth object or NEO, which means that it orbits rather closer than the asteroid belt between Mars and the Earth. And it's roughly a kilometer across. Now for NEOs, we think they originally started life in the asteroid belt as much larger bodies, and then collisions, radiation, and some other gravitational effects from the other planets <laughs> pulled these inwards scatter fragments towards the Earth. 
So here was our arrival. As we started to get closer and closer, we saw the asteroid more clearly on the navigation cameras. And we call these optical navigation cameras, or ONC. And Hyobusa 2 has three of these. It has two wide-angle cameras, ONC W1 and W2, and a telescopic camera, ONC T. Now, on February 22nd, we did our first touchdown operation. I should add, this has only ever been done once before for an asteroid, unsurprisingly, by Hyobusa 1. But Hyobusa 1 didn't capture this on camera. This was the first time this had been caught with a series of images. And the camera was actually contributed by public donations. Before launch, public money was raised to install this camera so it's looking down the sample hall. And it recorded this spectacular video. So currently, Hyobusa 2 is going to move slowly along the asteroid and synchronize its speed so that it can land down safely. And it starts off a little slow, and then we start speeding up as we approach the surface. And here we go. And just as Hyobusa 2 touches down, here is the sample hall, and this is our shadow. It's going to fire a five gram bullet into that surface just to stir up material. And that material can then rise up the sample hall and into the sample capture from Starlink storage. And you can see here all the bits flying away as Hyobusa 2 moves off. And these observations and this sample, they all tell us how we really began. And the mission isn't over yet. We've still got several more exciting operations. So do check out the website and Twitter feed. It's in both Japanese and English. So I've told you I'm an astrophysicist. And I've told you I'm a science communicator. There's one more thing I want to tell you about that not many people know. I'm also dyslexic. Which actually means I have a lot of trouble with spelling, and my handwriting used to be atrocious. It's now marginally possible. And this meant that when I was at school, I wasn't actually all that good. In fact, I found it very difficult. So, for example, when I was eight, I was told I was two years behind my peers at school. When I was ten, one of my teachers told me, in a fit of frustration, it must be admitted that my schoolwork was just too bad to bother to grade because my handwriting and spelling made it unreadable. When I was 11, I was bottom of maths in my class. And when I was 20, I was given an IQ test and the number came out as 91. The national average is 100. They said I was below average intelligence in this test. And of course it was because they weren't allowing me to have dyslexia. But it's also because these tests are garbage. And everyone laughed when that number came out. And I sort of laughed. Of course it was garbage. I was an undergraduate by this stage in theoretical physics at one of the top universities in my country. How could I be below average intelligence? And yet, because of imposter syndrome, you need to wonder, is it all true? Am I about to be uncovered? Was I never actually as smart as my peers? Nowadays, my success is not built on exams, which makes me feel a lot better, I have to be honest. But the point I'm trying to tell you is that you may have noticed school is hard. And sometimes it's really hard to shine. I think we all have skills and talents, but sometimes it's very hard for those to come out at school. It's a very tough environment. And you need to give yourselves a break if you're finding it hard. You should practice what you love doing, and don't let anyone tell you you're not good enough to do it. Don't give up. There are lots of reasons why you might change what you want to do. It's completely fine. But don't let it be because someone told you you weren't good enough. Success is 99.99999% of stubbornness, which now we typically try and call determination, but it's really just stubbornness and refusing to give up. And that's really what I want to tell you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for our special guest and our professor in the Pasta. And then, uh, if there's any questions you would like to hear, if you have any questions for Professor Aitasker, please. 
Oh, I have a question in the back, just one second. Your identity and posting on the website. 
like, and you told people about it. So did you ever feel like those people would judge you? And did that ever make you like hesitant to share your stories? Yes. I mean, one of the reasons my blog was initially anonymous is that I was worried for exactly that. Um, but people did know about my blog. My friends did. I shared it on Facebook. So the people who were close to me personally, they kind of already pre-vetted the material, and they never be nasty about it. But when I went public with who I was, I was concerned that maybe people would take me less seriously as a science writer because I have more privileged stories on my blog, or just because people know more about me, they would judge me from, I get judged from strangers. I didn't find that was the case. I actually found it was the opposite. Um, my blog is not terribly personal. It's personal in some ways, but not others. So for example, I have details about to go to see the gynecologist. I've got stories about that in my book. I don't typically have stories about my romantic relationships. So it's not emotionally personal to me. And I feel that she was doing a little bit. And that was just because I didn't want to write those stories. It's not because I specifically decided not to for this purpose. Um, but I did still worry about some judgment. But I found that actually people were relieved that they could read a funny story as well as a more serious science one. So the feedback I ended up getting was universally positive. Uh, but it was a concern, I didn't entirely know how it was going to go. When writing, do you ever view, how do you deal with um, imposter syndrome? Like feeling I'm not good enough and other people will write better things than me and they probably do than other people's writing? Yeah, it's, it is a problem and there are always better people than you out there. But that's ultimately not a bad thing, because it gives you something to aim for. How do I deal with it? I'm not sure I have a really good answer to that question. <laughs> I mean, sometimes having a deadline just means you've got to finish something. So even if you're not sure whether it's the greatest piece ever written by mankind, at least it's done. And often with science writing, many scientists don't write to write. They just don't want to do it. So I don't think the writing I do is the best in the world, but I do think it needs to go out there. And I do think that the majority of the time, the scientists who did the research won't want to do that writing themselves. So it's a choice between my piece, which I hope is reasonable, but I don't pretend to be the best, or absolutely nothing. And I think that gives me confidence to continue. And as you write more, and people get more interested in your work, that's a huge confidence boost as well. Like my friends who read my blog posts laugh. For me, I love making people laugh. It, it really boosts my confidence. And for science writing, more people start to approach me and ask me to do it. And that also makes you feel, maybe you're not the best in the world, but you must be doing a okay job. Is there any other questions?
as an IB student, I struggle sometimes with keeping my um, determination and being motivated to do work. But and you, made, you mentioned that success is 99% stubbornness. But do you have some tips on like maintaining that throughout your career? <laughs> so I have to confess that I'm a terrible procrastinator. I don't really am, because amazing what tasks will occur to me when there's something I have to do that I don't want to. And I think what works for different people is different. For me, I find uh, that, how do I do it? A lot of the time, I, I last minute panic really gets the job done. Um, <laughs> I do try to say, look, Elizabeth, you don't want to work on this right now. So what you're going to do is you're going to do it for the next hour, or you're going to do this one assignment, and then you're going to be able to take a break. So I basically bribe myself. I'm like, if you do this, I promise you can have the rest of the afternoon off and not feel guilty. And by doing that, you eventually get the job done, rather than leaving the whole thing and then having to stay up all night, which I have to say, I've never produced my best work in that situation, but I've often made a really solid attempt at it. So, Personal bribery, I think, is my recommendation. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, the one about me, I'll carry mine, fine. Um, do you ever consider giving, not giving up, but like trying something different? Yes. <laughs> and I think that's always healthy. Obviously now I have a permanent job. So I'm not so worried that tomorrow I will have to find something new. But I don't think opportunities for people ever stop. And, you know, I went into astronomy and astrophysics. The most logical place for me to work is a university. And it's kind of a space agency. Okay, it's, it's slightly different, but it is different. And I think it's always worth keeping your eye out about other things you might like to do. Uh, I, I frequently think that way. Maybe I would like to go back to some of my very messy and bloody novels and actually become a world famous novelist. Because I have to say that despite the email I got from Bloomsbury, I have not made it as a second woman on the Forbes Billionaire list. Science writing does not pay it any well. But maybe some of those really awful novels, they might be the way forward. So perhaps one day, I'll switch it for that instead. Any other questions? Okay, so one more time, give a big round of